I'm Ernie Humphrey, Educational Programs Leader for Performative, the largest online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, PwC Presents Stock Compensation Survey Results, Trends, and Accounting Challenges. Today's webinar will focus on what you know in effectively designing, managing, and delivering the right financial reporting for stock-based compensation plans. The discussion will focus on the preliminary results of PwC's 2013 Stock Compensation Assumption and Disclosure Survey, whose respondents included Fortune 100 companies and other large and established companies. The survey review will highlight the most prevalent findings and discuss the latest trends around assumptions and disclosure for equity compensation. In addition, our speakers will take the audience through the complexities of modification accounting for equity plans. Content to be discussed will include how companies can best manage key events such as equity restructurings, accelerations of vesting due to employment termination, and modification as a result to change in performance goals. I would like to thank Equity Administration Solutions Easy, whose commitment to thought leadership helps us make this webinar possible and delivered at no cost today. A quick note on today's agenda. First, we'll hear a joint presentation from our featured speaker, speakers, Kevin Hassan and Amy Lynn Flood, and then we will move to our interactive Q&A session where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards on any questions we did not get to. A few more logistical notes about the webinar. A link to today's presentation and video recording of the webinar we sent out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event. And please note the presentation is already posted at www.performative.com slash resources for free download. Those who would like CPE credits today will need to answer all polling questions during the event and should have pre-registered for CPE credit. For any questions on CPE credits, please send an email to cpe at performative.com. Again, we encourage you to ask questions on today's topic at any time via the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. You will be asked to take a short survey regarding today's webinar, and we greatly appreciate your feedback regarding our event today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. A quick word about Performative. Performative is the largest online community and resource for senior level corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. Performative connects corporate finance leaders to provide instant advice and insights on the tough financial and strategic challenges they face every day. Let's get started by introducing today's speakers, uh, Kevin, Kevin Hassan, Managing Director, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Kevin specializes in all aspects of accounting for employee benefits with specialization in the accounting for executive compensation, including stock-based compensation, short-term and long-term cash incentive compensation, and deferred compensation. Additionally, Kevin is a recognized subject matter expert throughout the firm on stock-based compensation issues. Kevin is in demand as a speaker on share-based payment accounting. Kevin has 32 years of varied experience, including in the auto practice for 17 years and in the global human resource solutions practice for 15 years. He is a member of GHRS HR Accounting Advisor Unit with primary responsibility, responsibility for consulting questions regarding the application of accounting principles surrounding stock-based compensation. Kevin is a CPA in the state of Connecticut since 1984 and graduated summa cum laude from Manhattan College in 1981. Our, our other speaker today is Amy Lynn Flood, partner of Global Human Resources Services Group, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Her practice centers on executive compensation and its related tax issues. She primarily focuses on implementation and maintenance of global equity-based compensation plans. She has significant experience in addressing the impact of corporate restructuring on global equity-based compensation plans. She, she is a graduate of LaSalle University and received her Master's of Science in Taxation at Drexel University. She is a licensed CPA in the state of Pennsylvania and has co-authored articles for multiple publications, including the Journal of Employee Benefits and Work Spend, and then quoted in CFO.com on Compensation Matters, and is a member of the National Association of Stock-Based professionals. Finally, in 2012, Amy was recognized by the Philadelphia Business Journal's 40 Under 40, which recognizes professionals for outstanding success and contribution to the community. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to turn the floor over to Amy Lynn Flood. Uh, Amy, please take it away for us. Thanks, Ernie, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon and this morning. Um, I think as Ernie said, we're, uh, he, he kindly gave us nice introductions, so we can, we can skip over that part. Uh, we're going to spend the afternoon really focusing on two main areas. One is uh, the review of our 2013 survey results, 
We'll give you a bit of an overview, um, talk through some of the key findings, um, and actually kind of bring this back even to the year of adoption. So we're going to take you back in time to 2006 and see if things how, how things have evolved over the past uh, six or seven years here. The other key area of focus is going to be on modification accounting for equity plans. And I think this is an issue that comes up quite a bit in our client base, and we thought it would be helpful to share with you kind of what we see as some of the more common um, modifications related to terminations, uh, modifications related to either performance awards or employee stock purchase plans, and also talk a bit about how equity restructuring uh, will impact the accounting for your awards. And then as Ernie said, we will certainly be leaving time um, for questions, so hopefully you'll be thinking through these as we get started. All right, so to kick it off, let me just give you a little bit of background. As, um, as we said, we just released this, our Stock Compensation 2013 Assumption and Disclosure Survey. Um, Basically, we performed an analysis of the stock comp disclosures by 46, what we define as high-tech or emerging companies, and 110 mature companies. And as it notes here, for our purposes, the definition of a mature company is a company that's been around for at least 15 years. All of the information that we analyzed is based on the um, public data. So we're looking at published annual reports and other publicly available information. Um, we included data from 2008 through 2011, and as I mentioned earlier, we also looked back to 2006 for comparison. And then we hope that you'll find this useful when thinking about your own company's assumptions and other data points associated with your stock comp plans. So this is certainly not um, to say everybody should change all the assumptions to the numbers that we're going to share with you, but really give you a sense of what we're seeing in these, um, let's say, 150 companies that we looked at a little bit more closely. So let's start with the high-tech or emerging companies. Um, you know, overall, I think what we found is that the option pricing model assumptions really didn't change that significantly from those at the end of 2010. We are finding that stock options continue to be the leading type of equity award granted, um, but this is certainly trending away from stock options. We're seeing more and more companies, as I suspect many of you on the line, moving away from stock options and moving more to a restricted stock. And I should probably also caveat that for purposes of this study, when we say restricted stock, we're encompassing pure restricted stock awards, restricted stock units, and any unvested kind of unit awards granted by the company. So we are using that as a collective term. Likewise, when we're talking about stock option, we're generally speaking about stock options and stock appreciation rights. So again, kind of blending them together for purposes of this analysis. Um, but we are certainly seeing the trend to restricted stock increase. Um, it's nearly a 60-40 split as opposed to a 70-30 split in 2010. However, the interesting part is that the value of the restricted stock granted far outweighed uh, the value of the stock options. So there was approximately $733 million worth of value in stock option grants compared to over $2.5 billion in restricted stock grants in 2012. So obviously a great disparity there. Um, when companies are valuing their stock options, we're seeing most rely heavily on the Black-Scholes model and really basing their expected term and volatility assumptions on historical experience. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. From a mature company perspective, it, it kind of feels like the same thing we just talked about. Um, we're seeing the equity awards granted um, continue to trend downwards from a stock option perspective. We're looking at a 50-50 split between stock options and restricted stock um, in 2012 compared to a 30-70 split in 2010. We're very much seeing stock options on the decline. And similar to what we just talked about from a high-tech emerging 
company perspective, the value of our restricted stock award is approximately $13 billion, which far exceeds the value of our stock options granted at a bit under $3 billion. Again, we're seeing most companies rely on the black sold model. And we'll talk about it more, but our volatility assumptions are essentially unchanged from when we reviewed this in 2010. And I think the good news is that our findings are somewhat consistent with what uh, we're hearing in the marketplace as well. Ironically enough, some of you might have already seen it this morning, um, but in the Wall Street Journal, the, the, the CFO.com um, released an article just this morning that talked about the use of stock options versus uh, restricted shares or restricted stock units. And they had found that in 99, um, you know, the peak of the, the bubble here, stock options accounted for about 78% of the average executive's long-term incentive package. Last year, that dropped to 31%, and they're expecting the use of stock options to shrink to about 27% in the next two years. And so there was an, actually a study done by um, James Rita and Associates looking through this, and they looked at about 200 large public companies um, and, and really kind of got to the same spot. So we were looking at it from an assumption perspective in terms of what people were doing. They looked at it from an overall compensation perspective. Um, but I think it's interesting to see that we're, we're coming up to the same results. And Kevin, maybe I'll just add, pause for a second and just ask you a comment. I mean, I think companies are getting more comfortable with the accounting now, too, right, going from not taking any expense at all back before 123R, ASC 718, to now taking the expense and better managing that for the restricted shares. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, I, I would absolutely agree with it, Amy Lynn. I mean, I think... Um, couple things I just wanted to kind of point out on both slides. You see that the value of full share stock, which is the restricted stock that we're classifying as restricted stock, which includes unit awards, are full value shares. So while we're giving out less shares, the dollar amount's a lot higher than the stock sure. options that are at cents on a dollar through the option pricing model. And the accounting is becoming a bit more clear to people. I would think that maybe it's not as still the right answer to a, a lot of you out there, but I do believe that, you know, people now understand how it has to be recorded, how it's attributed over a service period and all the basic accounting consequences. So I do believe that this is becoming more of a routine than it might have been, say, six years ago. Thank you for that. All right, so let's dig into it a little bit more. And, and the first thing that we had spent some time on is the option pricing model. Um, as all of you know, you know, companies have a choice, generally speaking, of what option pricing model they want to use, whether we look at the Black Shoals or some form of lattice model. Um, what we found is that the pricing model of choice continues to be the Black Shoals for both mature and our high-tech emerging companies. Um, as you can see here, 85% of the mature companies, 83% of our high-tech emerging companies use Black Shoals only in 2012. Um, we are seeing, though, lattice pricing models being used by about 17% of the high-tech emerging companies for some of their awards. And, you know, we suspect this is likely due to an increase in awards with market conditions, right? Those conditions um, that are generally indexed to the value of the issuer's shares or some other reason that necessitates kind of a more advanced valuation modeling. And, Amy Lynn, I just want to point out one one thing on this particular slide as well. Um, the 85-83 is clean um, black sheet. The numbers you see, the 17, and, the, and it would be the 15 on the uh, mature side uh, for 2012, that might be a combination of both. It may be people who have issued um, straight awards that they use Black Shoals, as well as there may be some performance units that have market conditions that require a more complicated model. So, so it, it, it may end up being that 85 is only and in, in the, the 17 and the 15 that, that you see there are kind of a blended model. I think there's a typo on this slide. I think the lattice model is used by 15% of the companies. Mm. Um, I think there is a typo, so I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thank you. 
And, and so let's talk a little bit more about the model assumptions and two of our key assumptions if we're talking about the Black-Scholes model being expected term and volatility. And so what we found is that, um, you know, in setting the expected term or volatility assumptions, our high-tech emerging companies and our mature companies both rely heavily on our historical experience. Um, for the expected term assumption, you know, 90 percent of the companies relied solely on their historical experience, while 2 percent used what we call the, the simplified method that might be available, and another 8 percent relied on other methods like a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the expected term. Um, you know, we may see um, when these high-tech emerging companies have been public for a longer period of time that they'll likely switch over from the simplified method to the historical method or, and or have already done so as they've been in the marketplace longer. Um, when we look at um, the 39 companies that we found the granite stock options in 2012 and report their assumptions, 90% of the high-tech emerging companies use, it, use historical stock price data as the basis for their volatility assumption where only 28% of these companies blended their historical experience with implied volatility, or that volatil volatility that's kind of inherent, inherent in any other market-traded options. Um, when we're looking at the basis for expected term, uh, particularly when we're thinking about our mature companies, again, many have continued to rely on historical experience. Uh, we found that 77% of the companies rely solely on their historical experience, while 8% use the simplified method, and another 15% relied on things like Lattice, Monte Carlo, or something else, depending on the complexity of their awards. Um, the, the difference, though, that you can see between the mature companies and the high-tech emerging, that 94% of our mature companies incorporated both his, incorporated historical stock price data into their volatility assumption, but almost half of these companies use a blended of both historical and implied volatilities. So we did see a difference between you know, the emerging companies and the mature companies as to how they derive their volatility assumption and what reliance they were using on implied volatility. Um, so continuing on with the expected term assumption, over this kind of five-year period that we looked at, so basically since 2008, um, the average expected term assumption has increased from 5.16 years to 5.62 years for our high-tech or emerging companies. Um, what this is suggesting is that the employees are choosing to hold their stock options a little bit longer, which would make sense since we had a, a dramatic market turndown during this um, five-year period. Um, as it notes there, that 57% of the companies use an expected term assumption falling within a range of four to six years um, compared to 61% in 2010. And then if we change a little bit just to talk about the mature companies and compare them to these high-tech organizations that I went through, we also saw an increase in the expected term assumption, increasing from about 5.3 to 5.73. Um, in 2012, 30% of the companies that we looked at increased their expected term assumption, and 23% of the companies decreased their expected term assumption from 2011. So definitely seeing some movement there, definitely potentially seeing some impact um, from the change in the marketplace. For the last two years, 60% of the companies assumed an expected term with a range of four to six years as compared to 56% of companies in 2010. So when we look at 2012 and compare it to 2011, um, the number of companies with an expected term of less than four years remains at about 8%, which is generally deemed a very short um, term uh, in the marketplace. And the number of companies with an expected term above six remained at 32 percent. So again, um, some slight increases in the expected term. Definitely the majority of companies still looking at something within the four to six range. Um, but we, we are seeing some movement there. Kevin, anything else you want to add on that point? 
No, I, I think a couple of, I think just one thing that I would add is, uh, you know, I think this, you, we may start seeing some of the, the terms changing around at, at this time next year once we, with the market recovery, because I, I do think that that people are looking at longer periods of time with awards that were to some degree underwater or not in, in were not in enough of the money for people to f exercise waiting for that ultimate market recovery. But I do think next year we'll probably see a, a, a drop in the terms, especially at the mature company level. The high tech ones, it, it's kind of a, a, a call on that, but generally it's all going to be market driven. And so let's talk about the other critical assumption here of volatility. And again, we'll start with my high tech emerging companies. Um, overall volatility increased most significantly from 2008 to 2009. Um, we saw an average increase of 5.5%. But once we got to 2011 or so, uh, we're really seeing more companies in the range of 40 to 50% for their volatility, um, as it notes there. Uh, with respect to the mature companies, um, again, average volatility increased significantly between 08 and 09. Again, kind of what, what, what we're seeing with economic changes. And while most um, assumptions have decreased from the 2009 levels and remain pretty steady between 2010 and 2012, our average volatility still exceeds our historical levels. And so in 2012, we saw 57 companies' volatility increase generally on average by approximately 2%, and then 23 companies' volatility decreased from 2011, generally by a 3% again. Um, for 2012, I think the interesting part with the mature companies as compared to the high tech is that most companies are not in any one range. We really are seeing a spread between 20% and 50% which if we contrast that with the high tech that we just discussed, the high tech almost everyone's between 40 and 50, um, but the mature companies were kind of all over the place. We're between 20 and 50 percent um, as it really does fluctuate amongst the various industries and the different sectors in the market. Okay, and so our last um, assumptions that we'll talk about, the risk-free rate and the dividend yield. I mean, generally, as you all know, these assumptions do not have as significant an impact on the uh, pricing model's results as term and volatility, but they really are still important factors in determining the fair value of the stock options. Um, what we found is that the risk-free interest rate decreased from 11 to 12 on average by about 80 basis points. Um, the average dividend yield for the nine High-tech emerging companies that declared dividends decreased from 1.64% in 2011 to 1.58% in 2012. Um, so we did see a bit of a, a decrease, though, albeit modest. And I, mean, um, I think well, I, I just want to say on that last point that you know, it may not, it may be a combination of two, like maybe somebody cut their dividend, or more importantly, it could just be a factor of the stock price going up and the dividend staying the same, so the mm -hmm. percentage ends up going down, but it may not be anything more than that. And for our mature companies, um, definitely saw trending in the same direction. Um, the average risk-free rates in 2012 were about um, a third of what they were in 2008 and probably about half of what they were in 2011. Um, also stayed within a relatively narrow range for the five-year period and saw just a small increase in the dividend yield um, for those companies that were granting dividends. Um, so again, a small increase in the average from 2.35 to 2.55 in 2012. But I think this is another interesting one because there was another piece of um, recent uh, on CNBC.com in April they were talking about um, the S&P 500 companies that are giving dividends to shareholders. And from a year-to-year -year comparison, 81% of the S&P 500 are now um, paying dividends per share. So it might be interesting if we have another year into this, if we start to see a little bit more movement um, in how people are computing the dividend yields, because there does seem to be a bit of a trend um, to paying out dividends more so than in the past. 
And then I think the last thing that we'll touch on before we, we switch gears and move into modification is really just this comparison of 2012 to our actual year of adoption. And this is really just to say, um, you know, while stock comp expense still remains kind of consistent as a percentage of earnings in 2012 with what it did in 2006, we are seeing this shift, as we talked about earlier, between stock options and restricted stock. We are seeing a pretty dramatic increase in the assumed volatility for mature companies from 26 to 35 percent. Um, so there are definitely some difference, although not extremely dramatic, but we are seeing movement when we compare what's happening now to what we saw back in 2006, with the biggest change being um, the, the movement to change our mix of equity awards. Um, we've seen both groups lower their risk-free rates that we talked about, and we've also seen both groups really increase their dividend yield assumption over this, uh, this period of time. Kevin, anything else you want to add on that one? No, and, and I think just the one thing I was just going to add on the, the, the volatility for the mature companies, I think some of that is being driven by the, the, the increase in term that we've seen. Mm -hmm as well as just, you know, the market vol the, the market itself being volatile for that period of time from 6 through 12. Yeah, absolutely. And so with that, Ernie, I think it's time for our first polling question. Oh, thank you very much um, for that great content um, and your insights. I, I'm going to go ahead and launch our first polling question. Uh, for those of you in the audience, just as a reminder, who are after CPE credit, you'll need to answer all three of the polling questions during the webinar. And of course, we appreciate everyone's consideration um, in answering all the polling questions. And time permitting, um, we, we may have time to review the results of the polling question and get comments from our speakers during the Q&A session. Um, again, um, we encourage you to please ask questions on today's topics uh, via the questions box in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. I'm going to go ahead and leave this polling question up for another 15 seconds or so so we can maximize the amount of time um, that we have to leverage um, the, the great speakers. Um, Amy and Kevin, I know the audience very much appreciates um, the preview on the survey results and are looking forward uh, to being able to access uh, that full report. So I'm going to go ahead and close down the polling question here. Okay. And then what I'll do here, and now uh, Amy, please uh, please go ahead and um, you can left click on your screen and take that control back for us. Sure. And so like I said, we're going to switch gears a little bit now and talk uh, more about modification accounting for equity plans. We're going to try to hit some of the more common issues that we bump into in our day-to-day -day lives here at PwC. Um, so Kevin, can I ask you to take the lead on this one? Absolutely. Thank you. Modification accounting under ASC 718 is much broader than any previous literature because what a modification is is any change to an option and reward that were not in their original terms. Just because you change the terms do not necessarily create incremental expense, but it does create a modification. That's a common question that we get all the time is, is this a modification? Well, the answer is yes, under the literature it is, but it may not have accounting consequences. So if, as long as we have that as a baseline, we you know, I just want to make that point. Some of the more common modifications that we see are option exchanges and repricings, especially with the underwater stock options. There was a there was a, a, a uptick in repricings and and or exchanges, taking options and exchanging it for restricted shares. As long as you do fair value for fair value, there is an incremental there is no incremental expense. Equity restructuring, spin offs, stock splits, large non recurring dividends, those are very common that we see. Obviously, if there's an acquisition or a divestiture, they're going to use generally yield modifications. And then here's some of the other changes to terms of awards, such as extending exercise periods. Generally happens, we see it in certain terminations of key executives. There's generally an extension of an exercise period. There could be an acceleration of vesting that's not tied in the original award. For example, you might if your awards automatically accelerate on a change in control, that wouldn't be a modification. But if you made the decision to accelerate vesting on certain awards that previously weren't in the original terms, that that would be a modification. Changes to performance targets. Sometimes if there's a heavy performance, and that could be 
performance under the standard or market under the standard, either one of them adjusting either type of targets. We're starting to see more of those. And then awards that go from equity to liability and liability to equity. Those are the common types of one modifications we as we get contacted on, Amy Lynn and myself. So it, within, the slide, within this slide, we're going to talk about the different types of modifications. And generally, th these modifications will fall under these four categories, though one and three are the most common that we're going to have. Type one is a, an award that was immediate, uh, immediately before the modification was probable of being vested, and immediately after is probable of being vested. The critical factor in modifications is it's not whether the award's going to be exercised or not in determining probability, it's whether it's going to vest, the service is going to be provided or not immediately before and immediately after. So with the type one modification, which was probable of vesting to probable of vesting, we're going to continue to account for the fair value for the original award plus any incremental cost as a result of the, the value of the award immediately before the modification and immediately after. So those two together will be recognized over the service period. A type three modification, on the other hand, is an award in which the, the initial award was improbable of being earned, which means you, you, you weren't going to earn the award. A, example of that would be, for example, a company who has a, has, is going to sell a, a plant, for example. And all the people in the plant that have awards would have lost the awards absent a modification, and as part of the sale of the business, you let them vest in either all of them or a part of them. So what happens is that any expense immediately before is, is reversed, and anything that's after, you're going to book in at the time of the acceleration, which is generally what happens at the time of the sale. So in this case, you're going to reverse prior expense, you're going to have a new measurement, and you're going to recognize that amount prospectively. Um, you can also modify a service period. Generally, you recognize the, the expense prospectively. It can be done one of two ways. A pool approach meaning taking the original amount plus the incremental amount and taking in as a pool over the remaining service, or a bifurcated amount approach, which would take the original expense over the remaining vesting period and any incremental over a different vesting period if it exists. So th those are the two approaches on when you change the service period for an award. And then generally what you have is an equity to, and an equity to liability modification. You have a grant date floor of the original expense. So if I have an award that was worth $10 immediately before, I'm going to have $10 worth of expense no matter what happens at the end. If, even if the award pays out, it's something less than that. So again, these are the types of things that we tend to see as accountants, and you and your business will tend to have happen. One and three are the most common. Generally, in a modification, you cannot end up with less expense than you originally had. The one key exception would be the type three award, because the original award wasn't probable of being earned. And then the, the award after the modification is probable of being earned. If the award after has less value than the award before, you end up with, you could end up with less expense. And so, Kevin, maybe I'll just ask you to pause there for a second. I mean, I think one of the things that we hear really the most is relation to kind of modification of the service period, right? And we hear quite a bit about companies that are either adding in retirement eligibility provisions or changing them or doing something um, a little bit different to cover these executives that they want to give some benefit to and they've spent a lot of time within the company. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk to some of the more common problems we see with these retirement eligibility provisions? Not necessarily problems, but things people need to think about when they're well, doing them. Well, the most critical factor with retirement eligibility is if the person becomes immediately, if the award is immediately earned because the person meets the retirement eligibility committee conditions, which are usually some combination of age and service, 55 and 10 years service, something like that, generally what happens is if I have an award that's outstanding that I was recognizing over, say, four years, and I'm two years in, I have to accelerate all that remaining expense in at the time of the modification. And then, but generally how I've seen a lot of people deal with that is they don't adjust the initial award, the outstanding awards, they adjust it going forward so that, but the critical factor there is in budgeting to make sure that they understand how many of those awards are going to vest immediately and how many of them are going to have truncated service periods because mm -hmm. the person may get to 55 and 10 after year one or year two or year three or before the, the original four-year vesting was going to happen. So generally, 
the flaws that we see or the, the some of the faults is people who don't who miss that people are retirement eligible. Um, and, and again, I think the retirement eligibility, depending on how far down in the company you grant awards, that could cause conceivable differences in how you expected the expense to be attributed and how it was going to hit your financial statements. So the critical factor to think about it when you're putting in retirement eligibility or you have them is to make sure that you've captured everything exactly correct. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, you know, equity restructurings we talked about a little bit about earlier, which are stock splits, spinoffs, and large non-recurring dividends. And, and basically, the idea behind these modifications are to preserve the value of the, the employee before and after the event. And so the critical thing here is you, you follow modification accounting, and then you need to make sure that your plan has a proper anti-dilution provision. And you're going to say, well, what's a proper anti-dilution provision? It's a provision that automatically makes the awards have to be adjusted. If you do not have that provision, um, you're likely going to have significant incremental expense because the award immediately before, you're going to assume that the event happened, and then immediately after, you're going to adjust it to everything. So you're going to have incremental expense because generally the, the, you're going to have less of a spread immediately before, and it's going to widen immediately after. But if you have the provisions, and, and I'll be honest, and, and I know, Amy Lynn, you're probably going to say, Kevin, you're wrong on this, but um, a number back in, when two, in 2006 and 5 and 6, when 123R ASC 718 came out, the accounting firms and the law firms were, were very keyed in on this particular provision because you needed to have it because everybody kind of figured out that this could be a huge cost, unknown cost, if you didn't have the provisions in there. Sometimes the question is whether the provision is automatic or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know most of the, what I've seen lately in, in equity restructurings have, in fact, had proper language, though you know some of them can be a stretch. For example, as long as the provision says the, the committee or the company must or shall make an adjustment but leaves discretion on what they do, change the exercise price, change the number of shares, change both. It, it, as long as they do, you can have discretion on how to do it. You just can't have discretion on doing it. Amy Lynn, any thoughts on that from your perspective? No, the only thing I was going to say, and I know we've bumped into this, do we have a concern if a company adds in an anti-dilution provision in anticipation of something happening? So there might be outstanding awards under the plan that were granted prior to the provision going in, we see the provision going in, and then the restructuring taking place. Is yeah, that's that the problem. Is the happy place? Okay, thank you. That, that is a problem. That's going to be one that's going to generate the incremental expense. You could put it in today, for example, awards that are granted. You could put it in today not in anticipation of anything, and, and it'll be fine. Immediately before and after is not the problem. But if it's put in in anticipation of an event occurring, that's going to be a problem because you're not going to get the benefit of the automatic language until the next one, not this one. Um, and, and again, down below we talk about make whole adjustments. Generally it's, you know, the most common ones we see are an exercise price adjustment, a quantity adjustment, some combination thereof. And then uh, in certain cases you may see some cash being exchanged as part of this as well. But as long as the value of the award before and after is, is close or the same, you, you're not going to have a, you should have no little or no incremental expense. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think we've had some companies who were surprised thinking their anti-dilution provision was um, hardwired and they were okay, and then found out that because it was done in anticipation of a transaction, they had some unexpected problems. So, so I wanted to raise that one. All right, let me move the slide for you. So here's a, a, a specific example that we're using, and it's um, there can be incremental value even with an anti-dilution provision. So we're going to start here with a uh, dividend of seven dollars. So we're going to assume that the the option strike in the beginning was thirty dollars. The stock price immediately before was forty. Immediately after was thirty-three. They made no adjustment except just paid the seven dollars. So when we did the Black Shoals calculation immediately before. That $40 or $10 in the money stock option had a value of 1579. 
when we did the 33 to 30, we did a black Scholes value, came out at 1049. So now you say, okay, well, we're good, we're under, but well, no, we're not, because we now have to add that $7 cash payment to that 1049, so now we have a value of 1749 for the award immediately after. We're going to compare the 1749 to the 1579, and we're going to have an incremental expense of $1.70 times all options. Outstanding. So while normally you don't end up with expense, there are ways to do it where you could, like in this one, because we didn't adjust the options, the shares, or the prices. Instead, we just gave cash. We need to look at the cash plus the, the post-combination or post-restructuring or modification option value to see what it is compared to the immediately before. So here's an example where we could have an increment. And Kevin, one thing we talked a little bit about earlier on, but I was wondering if maybe you could give some examples of what we're seeing in practice. When we talked about modification accounting, we said that other changes to the original terms of the grant could be problematic, and we referenced some adjustments to performance targets. Could you maybe give some live examples of what we're seeing with performance awards? Now that we're seeing many more companies use them, but where are some of the hiccups or things to watch out for from an accounting perspective? Well, the most common ones we see, right, there's, there's a couple. Um, you set your targets, and let's assume that a significant portion of your equity compensation is going to be targeted to performance-type awards. So I need to hit whatever, let's say we could use EPS targets, EBITDA targets, revenue targets, whatever the case may be. So where the hiccups come in is we're now getting close to the end, and let's assume that a significant portion, 75% of all stock compensation is, is sitting in performance and they're not going to be earned. So what, what companies are stressed with is, well, how do I provide value to the individual who, who might have done everything they possibly could to get that award, but for some reason, you know, a contract got lost that was not, you know, because of bidding and, and whatever the case may be, and so now I need to give something. So now, if I make an award, immediately before that was improbable of being earned, right, because I'm not going to hit the target, and then I turn around and make the target attainable, I now have a type 3 modification where the award immediately before, because it had probably a zero chance of ever being earned, the fair value of that's going to be very small, where the award immediately after is going to have a much higher value. So you end up seeing when I change the, the, the targets, I end up with an incremental, large incremental expense. Another is that I've started to see actually a bit more recently is people who had performance targets taking them away and making them service only. And so when I have a target immediately before that's based on a performance assessment, I may assess the awards not probable of being earned, where immediately after the award, I have an award that's, that's going to be probably earned because I only have to work another three months or six months to get it. So I end up with a significant amount of incremental expense again because the, the initial award was not probable of being earned. The award immediately after is probable of being earned. I'm going to revalue that award today and I'm going to take it in over the remaining service period, which would be the three to six months in my particular example. Another that we're starting to see is modification to market provisions, market conditions, TSR awards stock price awards, whatever the case may be that, that's tied to your stock price. And what we've started to see in there is modifications to those awards. The one point I want to make, because your award immediately before the was, was based on a market condition and that had some assessment of probability, the fair value that you recorded in your financial statements based on that initial award already assumed the award was probable of being earned. So there was no probability assessment. So any adjustment to a market conditioned award is going to be considered a type 1 modification, probable to probable. You have a floor of the initial cost, and any incremental cost gets recorded. Whereas when you modify performance conditioned awards, something tied to company goals or personal goals, those most likely are going to be type 3 modifications. So it could be type 1. It just depends on where you are in the process and whether, what, what your assessment of the award was immediately before. So commonly, you're going to see when you modify performance conditioned awards, you're probably going to end up with a significant amount of incremental expense. Yeah, and I think these issues are becoming more and more common as we're seeing more people um, granting performance awards. So thank you for going through some of those, um, the more common ones. 
Um, and I think with that, Ernie, it's time for our next polling question. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that great insight and those specific examples. I know that is um, very valuable to the attendees. So I'm going to go ahead and launch um, our second polling question. And for the, for the sake of time, uh, first a reminder that those of you in the audience here for CPE credits are going to need to answer all three polling questions. And we appreciate everyone's consideration um, in answering the, the, answering the survey question. But I'd like to go ahead and open up the Q&A session so we can take advantage um, of, of the time um, that we have uh, with, with our great speakers here today. Um, can, can you speak to um, Amy Lynn to, to uh, you know, before you had uh, a, lo a look at the initial results and, and once you had a chance to look at those, what would you characterize as the one or two biggest surprises in the results, things you were expecting to see and you didn't see or something that may have even been opposite of what you expected? You know, I, I think probably the surprise was there wasn't any big surprises. Um, and I'm not sure we were necessarily expecting them. I mean, particularly when you're looking at assumptions being used um, we knew just from some other survey work and just dealing with our clients that options are clearly on the decline. And so we were, you know, pleased to see this validated once again that people are using restricted stock, restricted stock units more and more often. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if, you know, options fall off the table at some point. Although, um, you know, we'll hear people saying that options are generally a better potential wealth accumulator because you have that 10-year or maybe 8-year term to actually choose when to exercise and figure out how much money you want to try to achieve as opposed to that restricted share um, that you might not have the opportunity to necessarily decide when you're actually going to recognize the income. So we're still seeing arguments on both sides of that, but again, the, the survey data reflect it. I think what we expected in terms of the mix of equity. Um, and I think the volatility in the expected term, we didn't expect to see some major changes, right? We know when the market's going through some fluctuations. We knew 08 and 09 back then were going to be different just because of what was going on. Um, but I think the surprise, non-surprise, is that we're just seeing minimal adjustments in some of the other assumptions. I think most of our organizations have a pretty good handle now on how they want to value these awards or are using outside consultants to help them as well. Um, so I think they've, the, the industry has evolved as well. People are getting more used to the accounting rules know what's expected of them, and have a better handle on how to, you know, figure out the values for their assumptions. Kevin, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, from my perspective, when I, when I was looking at the survey results, what, what I was more in, most interested in, because we've been kind of tracking them year over year over year, was when we went back to 2006 to adoption, where everybody was trying to estimate what they thought the assumptions were going to be, and people did a lot of analysis or, or did diagnostics to kind of figure out where they were. Um, I think what surprised me was that there wasn't that big of a change over the six years in terms of some of the, some of the assumptions. Because I, I thought that in the beginning people were going to, you know, be, take, take a look at something and, and work with it. I just I don't know whether that's a factor of people got really comfortable and maybe it's time to relook at assumptions again because I'm aware of some situations where some really ultra conservative term assumptions are being used and calculated and you know maybe if they looked at them slightly different they could lower the term and maybe lower it by you know up to a year I, I so again I think what surprised me was that there wasn't that much change from adoption to today. Or, or through 2012, because I would have expected that, I, that some of those assumptions may have changed. And the other thing that I guess kind of validated all along that whomever adopted using a lattice methodology pretty much stayed there. Um, and the people who were on Black Shoals pretty much stayed there, because we haven't seen a whole lot of swing from lattice to Black Shoals. And the only, the only way we see it is if the changing awards, right, that we're, we're giving more market condition awards, which under the literature you have to use a, a more complex methodology. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much um, for both of your insights there. Um, Kevin, I'll direct this one to you. Um, so, so one of the things um, you noted um, in the survey was that, was that there was, that there was a, a trend from, from options up to restricted stock. Can you comment as, as to why you think that's happening and what the benefits of offering restricted stocks, oh, shares over options might be? 
I think the reason is is because one, well I think it's there's two different ones. I think the first one is you you use less shares to do it because options you generally grant four or five or historically it's been four or five or somewhere in that range option for share of stock because again that, that people would perceive the option as not as valuable as a share of stock because today I could have an option that's underwater where the, the exercise price is still below the stock price when granted whereas a share of restricted stock or a share of stock will have value all the way down to you know to, to basically any value you're, you're going to have some value and you're going to be able to take it out as well um, so I, I think two things one is I think it, it uses less shares so that when companies need to go out to shareholders to get to get revisions on share limits it, it's going to take a lot less to get there um, versus options which you're going to have to give or stock appreciation the rights for that matter same thing where you're going to end up giving more shares to replace the same value if you remember in our survey results you, you saw it, it was some pretty wide ranges like I think in in the mature companies it was like 13 million of shares versus 3 million of options or something like that and and, and the, the, or 13 billion I might have said the wrong number but um, but the idea behind it is is that while I'm giving basically a 50-50 split, there's much different expense recognition for you, but I'm also giving a, a pro rata a lot less shares to make up that, that amount of money. Right. And then I think also companies were thinking about dilution as well, to that very point you just made, that they're you know, giving out less, less shares and getting a higher value. I think more and more companies are being more thoughtful around dilution and, and avoiding any shareholder concerns about getting so many of these shares out. And, and it also has a related EPS impact, right, because I, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll have potentially less shares to be in the dilution. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll start um, this one to Amy Lynn. Feel free to comment or, or pass along to Kevin. Um, what are the accounting issues with, speak to some of the accounting issues with hybrid restricted stock programs? such as vesting only after stock price increases beyond, let's say, X percent? Kevin, you can take that one if you want. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is a, a typical market condition award. So when you value the award day one, you're going to have to run that through a model to come up with a predictive element to it. So what you're going to do is you're going to run that into some kind of a lattice methodology, whether it's a, a Monte Carlo or a binomial trinomial, to, to, to assess when you think that award's going to grow by that particular stock growth, double in price, triple in price, whatever it might be. And then that award and that service period is what kicks the value in that service period kicks out. And that's the expense you're going to recognize. Now, interestingly, with that award, that type of award, once the service has been provided by the individual, meaning the service period that came out of that model, whether they get the award or not, that expense is going to stay in your financial statements. It's never reversed. Whereas a performance condition award, which is something tied to goal or you know a company or a personal goal, if it's not attained, would would never be expensed. It would be taken back. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'll direct this one. I'm, I'm back to England again. Do you have any high level comments on how you think the survey metrics and trends would have been different if you would have included um, early stage privately held companies? Hmm. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. I think, um, you know, the, the reason we go is obviously because they're, they're hard to come by and they obviously have some different um, ways of valuing their equity. Um, so I just think they would look somewhat like an outlier in this survey, I would suspect, if we were to pull them together and think about how they value their equity and or how they use um, equity, because I think there are different ways um, and they're more apt to use an option, um, uh, particularly depending on their structure, than a restricted stock award. So I think we would see changes in the mix um, and just an overall change in kind of the, the usage of the award. Kevin, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, and, and along those lines, I, I would agree with you that I think most companies would use options. The, the other problem here is, how, how liquid are these words going to be? Is there repurchase elements? Is there, how are the people going to be able to monetize those? Because generally, in, in, in non-public entities, the question becomes, 
what's the motivation to have somebody to exercise if they can't monetize it? So term, I would expect the term to be longer, and I, expect, I would expect the fair value per award to be longer than it would be for a public company where somebody could turn around and, and sell it in the market after they get it. Um, so, I mean, I think Amy Lynn's right. I think most places you're going to see options, and I would expect the fair value of the option to have a much longer term because of, because of those factors. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the questions. Again, the questions, uh, you can still ask questions in the questions there if you go to the webinar control panel. Um, a little bit of a, of a technical question. I'll direct this one on Kevin's way. Are option grants to be valued at the date of award and aggregated with prior grants, or, or are they to be valued collectively? Once, once you grant an award, that award stays fixed as long as you don't change any terms. That stays fixed through the through the service period, so then the next set of awards would come in, they'd have a new value, and that would be the same same factor. You would do it and take it in over a period of time. Now, when you mean by aggregate, you could aggregate them all, but again, to track, and Amy Lynn will get ready to jump all over this, from the tax accounting perspective, you would need to keep them separate yes. in order to be able to, to figure out how it works. But on a particular grant, you could aggregate all of them together and value it. However, from a from a, a tax tracking pr perspective, you'd probably want to keep them separated within that one particular grant. Amy, yeah, Lennon. absolutely, a absolutely. Because in order to figure out how we're going to reverse the deferred, we need to match up um, the award with its original black soul value. It becomes much more cumbersome to do the tax counting if it's all blended together. And what we do find is that most of the public companies that are using kind of external stock plan administrators, they do give you the opportunity to just kind of match up the Black-Scholes value with each grant to make that tracking a lot easier. But it's my worst nightmare when it's all commingled when you're trying to do the tax accounting elements. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Our next question, um, it'll, hopefully it'll be a quick answer. Uh, is, there, is there a challenge in, in rather than modifying an option grant, um, cancel it and completely an issue a new grant? Well, uh, the, the accounting for a modification is actually a cancellation and reissue. That's kind of what the literature based it on. If you cancel an award and you don't regrant something within a six-month period, you would end up with two charges. You'd end up with the initial award, plus you'd end up with the new one. But if you cancel and do an, a, a replacement award within, you know, People will say you can go up to six months. I mean, I will tell you that most people do it concurrently only because of the, the, the perspective of the individual that has the award. But a cancellation reissue and a modification, the accounting ends up becoming the same, except in the situation where it's a, a long period of time. Okay, great. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, um, I just want to um, go ahead and close the Q&A session. We have questions that didn't get answered. Um, what we'll do is we'll, is we'll connect with the speakers and get those questions answered for you directly or on performative.com. I'm going to go ahead and launch our last polling question. Um, as I make some uh, final comments here, we'll leave the polling question up uh, briefly a minute or so. So please, again, if you're in the audience for CPE credits, you'll need to answer uh, this final polling question. And we appreciate um, your consideration um, in answering the polling questions. Everyone. Uh, everyone on the webinar today. Um, just as a reminder, um, you'll be asked to prompted to take a short survey once the webinar concludes. We greatly appreciate your feedback regarding the event, and we invite you to please join us at www.performative.com to ask any um, additional questions you may have and continue the conversation um, with, with your peers and experts um, that you've heard from today. Um, we, we would like to thank um, Amy Lynn and Kevin um, for their time and their valuable insights. Um, they are clearly thought leaders in their fields and an excellent source of information on today's topics. Please note that in the post-webinar survey, you have the opportunity to express your interest in being connected with either or both speakers or our sponsor with just a few clicks of your mouse. Uh, and and, I, and again, I would like to thank our sponsor, Equity Administration Solutions Easy. Again, without them, that, this event would not be possible. And finally, in closing, I would like to thank the audience um, for your valuable time. Thank you very much, everyone, and make the rest of your day great. Appreciate it.